I've built a couple of these Moravian stools, and it is a great project that most people are never going to try. And that's because of this sliding dovetail joint. It's really not that hard, but some folks are just intimidated. So we need a simpler, easier version that's better for beginners. And actually, I just built that easier version. No sliding dovetail, no fancy joinery, but all the looks and class of the original. And the best part is, you can build it out of any old garbage wood. The stuff I have here is literally garbage. It's old shelving from the trash. Someone covered it in wood grain contact paper, which is weird since this is, you know, actual wood and already has a wood grain. Whatever. This yellow pine is going to make a great piece. I'll cross cut my stock to length and then clean up the ends with my jack plane. The biggest piece in the project is the seat, so I picked a nice clear section with no knots or defects. I'm lucky enough to have wide stock, but you can easily make the seat from two narrower pieces, and we'll cover that later in the video. Next, we're going to need the legs. You're probably going to use three-quarter material, just like I did, so we're going to need to cut out some leg blanks and glue them up. I really like doing these big rip cuts at the saw bench. This is just my lightweight traveler workbench. I made it to be a portable bench, but it also makes sawing a lot more ergonomic by letting me get on top of the wood and use the big muscles in my back and shoulders. Of course, none of those ergonomics matter if your saw is dull, so I have to stop and touch mine up. You really want to sharpen your tools before you start the project, but it doesn't always work out that way. It takes discipline to stop and sharpen, but it's worth the trouble. Now, my saw cuts faster, and it's easier to stay on the line. Once I've got four big leg blanks, I need to rip those in half, and I'm going to do that on the bandsaw. It's late in the day, and I'm getting tired. Using a machine lets me save some energy and get more done before quitting time. For each leg piece, I'll straighten out one edge and clean up one inside face. I'm going to shape those legs later, so there's no point in making perfectly square blanks. If my glue up is straight and has a clean joint, then I'm happy. This goes fast, and three clamps is all you need. The last part we need is these battens, and I could make these out of three quarter inch stock, but I would like a little bit more thickness to hold the leg joint. So instead, I'm going to make these out of scrap two by four. I need these pieces to be a bit narrower, and this rip cut would be slow and frustrating. Much better to do a little rough trimming with the hatchet and then sneak up on my line with the jack. It's quick and accurate. I left my stock long to make it easy to dimension. Now I'm going to cut it in half and trim off the waist. This thick stock would be awkward on the shooting board, but I can just clean it up in the vise. I'm keeping the toe of the plane registered on the work and using this circular motion to get nice, clean end grain. Now, we need these battens to be thick for strength, but we don't want them to look super thick and chunky. So cutting a wide chamfer on all of the edges is gonna cut down on visual weight and make these pieces look a lot lighter. I've penciled in some guidelines for my chamfers, and the edges are no problem, but those ends will be difficult to plane. I can give myself a longer surface by clamping them together. I'm also adding a piece of scrap wood to the end to absorb any damage. I can work aggressively with my foreplane, and all that chip out happens in the scrap wood. Then I can switch to my fine metal jack and work down to my lines. When I take off the clamp, my ends are neatly chamfered. When you chamfer the ends first, then any damage you do get will come off when you do the long edges. So always do the ends first. These battens took a minute, but they're neat and crisp. They'll look good in the finished product. When the legs come out of the clamps, they just need a quick square up, and then they're ready for joinery and shaping. After the four leg blanks were done, I made a fifth out of two by four. Then I took a few minutes to practice the joint and all the shaping. Make your mistakes on scrap, and your actual legs won't give you any trouble. We're going to cut the joinery before we taper the legs, because the stock is square and easy to hold. This is a simple round tenon, and you can cut it with basic tools. First, find the center. Then, drill into the end until the bit just makes a clean circle. Everything inside the circle is your tenon, and everything outside is waist. Our joint also needs a shoulder, so strike a line two inches from the end, 
and saw down those lines just a little bit. Don't forget to go a little deeper at the corners. Most of the waste can just be split off with a chisel and a mallet. Because we made those saw cuts, the splits will stay right on the end, and then we can move on to trimming. A broad chisel is perfect for this work, and you want to skew it for a slicing cut. Another great tool is a coarse metal file. You can use it to chamfer the end and get ready for the test block. This is just a scrap of hardwood with a hole drilled in it. As you press the test block down over your tenon, it will stop moving and leave a line where the joint is still too fat. Start at the line and trim down, taking light cuts. As you work, keep grabbing the test block and rotating it down onto the tenon. Each time, your line will move further down the joint until finally it goes all the way down to the shoulder. Then you're done. When I built the original Moravian stool, I cut those joints on the shave horse and a couple of them on the lathe, and you might be wondering why I'm doing it differently in this video. Well, it all comes down to the way you taper the legs. For the original Moravian, I put the fat part of the taper at the bottom and the skinny part up on top, so there's not a lot of material around the joint, and it made way more sense to shave those joints down or turn them on the lathe. For the Moravian stool in this project, I flipped that taper around and it's fat up on top. That means I've got lots of stock that I can rest my chisel in and split off all of that waste. So the way you cut the joint depends on where you do the taper. And now that our joints are cut, it's time to taper our legs. Making that taper is easy. You just draw a few lines with a straight edge and then plane down to your lines. I covered this in a lot of detail in my original Moravian video, and I have all the measurements in the plans. I've got plans for both the original Moravian and this new Easy Moravian, and we'll talk about all those at the end of the video. Once the legs are tapered, I'm going to turn them into octagons by planing off the corners. You can draw in guidelines, but it's easier to just go by eye. I plane a bit, have a look, and then do a bit more rotating the leg as I go and keeping all the facets the same size. And here's a patron tip. My little V-block works even better with those round tenons. Rest the tenon in the block and you can rotate it effortlessly while you slowly work out your taper and your octagon shape. And don't forget a little bit of shelf liner for added grip. It makes all the difference. To finish up the legs, we just need to trim the top of the leg where it meets the tenon. This is only for looks, and it makes for a smoother transition between the leg and the seat. I'll rough these details in with my chisel and then smooth them out with my file. We're just about ready to assemble, so now's a good time to cut the handhold into the seat. It's just a few overlapping holes. Chisel out the waist and then finish the inside surfaces. Now, you might need to make your seat out of two boards, and that's just fine. Lots of basic Moravian stools are made with narrow lumber. You don't even need to glue the two pieces together, and leaving them separate means you don't need to drill your handhold. You can just cut it out of the two edges with a coping saw or a turning saw. It's pretty easy, and it's a traditional way to make the piece. To assemble the stool, we're just going to screw the battens to the seat. Screws make an excellent connection for this project, especially because they allow some wood movement and your stool is very unlikely to crack. This part seems simple, but there are a couple of tricks that make it a lot easier. I'm going to mark my holes with a Forstner bit. The bit allows me to get the holes perfectly spaced from the edge of my batten with no measuring. When you drill your holes, open your vise and use that as a bridge. This way you won't have to worry about drilling into your bench. Carefully find the position for each batten. Then drop screws into each hole. Tap each one with a hammer and you'll get a perfect location for the holes under the seat. You don't want to drill through your seat, so put a bit of tape on your drill bit and go slowly. These little bits try to pull themselves in, and sometimes you have to pull back while you're drilling. Use the tips of your screws to find those holes and carefully settle the batten in place. When you tighten the screws, don't use your impact driver. That tool is too powerful, especially for softwood, and you can strip your screw holes. Running your fasteners in by hand doesn't take long, and you get a much better connection with even pressure on each screw. Drilling the legs is actually really simple, even with a compound angle. I'm just going to strike a 45 degree line through each of my leg locations and then place my bevel gauge right on that 45 degree angle. 
I can use a carpenter square to keep that bevel lined up, and I don't have to draw a bunch of lines under my seat. I covered drilling the holes in my other Moravian video, but it's not complicated. You just drill along the 45 degree line and tilt your drill to match the 15 degree angle on your gauge. These simpler Moravian stools don't carry the holes all the way through the seat, so be careful with your depth and don't break through. Installing the legs is a snap because we're not going through the seat and we're not wedging the tenons. All you need to do is put a bit of glue in the hole, brush some around the tenon, and then slide the leg into place. You might have a tight fit and need to tap the leg a little bit. We're going to cut off the ends when we level the stool, so don't be afraid to wail on them a little if you have to. This glue sets up fast, so there's no time for indecision. Once the legs are dry, you just need to level the feet. I put scraps and wedges under the legs until the seat is level in both directions. Then glue a pencil to a scrap of wood and scribe a line around each of the legs. I need to take an inch and three quarters off the height of my stool, so I made my block an inch and three quarters high. You can control the height of the finished stool by changing the height of that block. The last step is to saw through those lines to level out the legs. Once you've cleaned up those saw cuts, your stool is finished. Now, when I built the original Moravian, I sent the legs all the way through the top, slit them with a saw, and pounded in a hardwood wedge to spread that tenon out. That makes the joint extremely solid. But with these newer Moravians, the ones that have screwed on battens and legs that don't travel all the way through, well, there's no place to put a wedge in. And I was really curious how those stools could still hold up. That newer style, where the leg doesn't travel all the way through, there's tons of those out in the world, and they're pretty old, so they've survived a long time. But how would they do that if the leg is just glued in? It doesn't seem strong enough. Anyway, I was looking at a lot of pictures of these older stools for this video, and I found this one. And it's a nice looking little piece, but the important thing is let's zoom in. And right there, that's a peg. That peg travels through the batten and through the leg tenon and locks it in place. That's the missing link. That's how these simpler Moravians are still strong and durable. And we can easily add that to the stool we're making. To reinforce my joints, I'm going to drill in with a twist bit. I'm on an angle, so I go through the tenon, but I'm careful to stop before I break out on the other side. Then I've put a little glue on a bamboo chopstick, and that's a tight fit, so I'm hammering it into place. The cramped space and weird angle make the peg impossible to trim with any of my joinery saws, so I'm just using a bare hacksaw blade. It works surprisingly well. If you'd like to make a Moravian stool, there are a bunch of different ways you can do it. You can build the classic Moravian with the sliding dovetail and the legs that travel all the way through the seat. This is intimidating to some people because of that sliding dovetail, but that's also why I built it. I wanted to try something new and build my skills. It wasn't that hard. If you know you can't tackle this, build the newer Moravian stool. Still an old, traditional piece of furniture, much easier to build, and you still get the same basic end product. People have been asking me a lot this year, Rex, why do you keep building these Moravian stools? I mean, this is number two and number three, and the answer is practice. I hate to break it to you, but if you've only built something once, you're probably not good at it yet. You know how to do it, but you're probably not actually good at it. To get good, you need repetition. I want to be good at these, so I built a couple. I built a couple of different kinds. We have got plans for both of these styles so that you can practice, you can build a couple of them, but you can add some variety to your woodwork by building different versions, and you can mix and match. You can do some aspects of this one and some aspects of this one. The plans for both stools are very affordable, and we will link to those down in the description. Don't forget about my Green Woodworking Festival, Greenwood Live. It's going to be in Burton, Ohio on July the 29th. That's a Saturday. It is going to be an amazing day filled with traditional crafts, green woodworking, chair making, spoon carving, blacksmithing. We're going to have food. We're going to have music. It's going to be incredible. If you are anywhere in the Midwest at the end of July, you are going to want to be there. The best way to keep up on Greenwood Live is to get on our mailing list. 
We'll put a link to that down in the description. You can get all the news right as it comes out. We're just about ready to start announcing our teachers and to start the ticket pre-sale so you can get your tickets early and get a discount. Click on that link and get on the mailing list. Big thanks to my patrons who make all of this stuff possible. And of course, a huge thanks to my viewers. I wouldn't be here without you. Thanks for watching.